It's good. It is good to be here with all of you, friends, colleagues, relatives. And um, I'm happy to also just share this time with Crystal and to share with you um, really wonderful um, information and celebration, celebration of um, Native people across this country. Miigwech, Crystal. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and get started. And I am extremely honored to introduce Ralph and Dennis Zotai. Uh, Ralph and Dennis are from the Kio Kiowa. Oh, Kiowa. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, sorry. Kiowa tribe and have facilitated cultural presentations and performances in more than 40 countries and all 50 U.S. states. Um, Ralph and Dennis co-founded the award-winning Zotai Singers Group, which has produced six albums, and they've been nominated for the Native American Music Award and the Aboriginal Music Award in Canada for their singing excellence. Um, Ralph is a former traditional music instructor at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and Dennis currently serves as a cultural specialist at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, and he writes for the Smithsonian Magazine. So um, please join me in welcoming father and son, Ralph and Dennis Zotai. Thank you for that introduction. Is the mic on? Yes, it is. Look. We're honored to be a part of your kickoff celebration for Native American Heritage Month. We'd like to start out by introducing our featured performer this afternoon, and her name is Angela Gladu. Angela, will you please come out at this time? Angela is a member of the Frog Lake First Nations near Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where she served as a dance instructor for the Aboriginal schools in that area. She is also a principal dancer for Hallucine Nation, formerly a tribe called Red. And right after this, she's going on tour. So we're very happy to have her today. Songs, prayers, ceremonies, and objects equal a ceremony. The dance we're going to start out with at this time is a part of a healing ceremony. It began as a story, a beautiful story of healing. Native people believe there is a healing presence among the creator and nature. We're going to travel to the Great Lakes region at this time where a beautiful story has unfolded. It is said that there was a granddaughter and this granddaughter was very ill. Her grandfather did the best he could with all the medicinal works that he had in, that were available to him, but nothing was healing the granddaughter. And so he went out into the forest for four days and four nights to fast and pray. On the fourth day, Gichimanitu, the great creator, spoke to him in the form of a dream. The creator said, go back to your village. Do not give up on your granddaughter. Get four kokums or grandmothers to make four dresses that are pleasing to the ear and pleasing to the eye and have a ceremony in which they dance around this young sick girl. And so this grandfather went back. The ladies make this dress, these dress, four dresses, and they had the ceremony. It is said the little girl could not move at the beginning of the ceremony, but by the time it was finished, she stood up and she danced. Thus is the story of the origin of this dance. This is originally called a medicine dance because of that, but today in modern powwows, it is called the jingle dress dance. <clears throat> Oh, <laughs> 
Thank you very much. And now that was your opening. Yeah. Songs like this just are so moving to our hearts. And it just is a wonderful reminder of the strength. And this means like um, the strength of our people and it nothing, you know, it gives me better pleasure and even fills uh, my heart with more strength than having people like uh, Ralph be in, 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 to be in their presence. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, now we'd love to just give a moment to um, send, give some time over to our uh, executive director, Allison Barlow. Thank you so much. Um, that was such an honor to be part of that uh, blessing for us today. And um, just to start us off now in a good way, let's see, we have to advance our slides. I don't know. We need Anna to the rescue. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, great. Thank you. Um, we just want to start today by honoring the land that we are on um, as an important acknowledgement that we are on indigenous people's land. We humbly acknowledge that Johns Hopkins University is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of indigenous peoples. Our campus resides on unceded lands of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. We recognize the enduring presence of more than 7,000 indigenous peoples in Baltimore City, including the Piscataway, Lumbee, and Eastern Band of Cherokee community members. As we gather from places across the country and globe, we honor and recognize indigenous peoples of our homelands. Together, we acknowledge the history of genocide and ongoing systemic inequities while respecting treaties made on this territory as a step towards reconciliation and strengthening relationships with indigenous peoples. We give thanks to the past, present, and future stewards of this land and respect all tribal nations' sovereignty and right to self-determination. We, we aim to hold ourselves and our university community accountable to tribal nations. This is really an important part of, of today, um, of Native American Heritage Month. And most importantly, we cannot celebrate and honor indigenous peoples one day or one month a year. We must honor indigenous peoples every day, every minute that we are on this earth. 6% of the world's population is indigenous and they protect 80% of our biodiversity. They hold the keys to planetary wellness. We have so much to learn from indigenous peoples. So I've been so lucky to be part of um, explosive growth during COVID for our center. And what happened through that is our team swelled from about 150 um, team members to 300. And now those 300 people, over 88% are indigenous. What has been really important is to grow our indigenous leadership. And I'm so honored um, to be um, in the presence and be working with two new co-directors of our center, Dr. Melissa Walls and Dr. Donna Warren. They are incredibly inspiring people and also leaders like Crystal Greensky and Crystal Austin who've come to our center to hold very important administrative and faculty roles. So we're growing in a really good way and it's really exciting. Melissa has taught me a lot about what it means to be a critical ally. And I just want to quote her, and I want all of you to take up the helm of critical allyship. Um, Melissa has said in her words, she emphasizes that allies are needed as co-conspirators to help disrupt the systems of oppression. So you all are all now invited um, to consider ways that we can be the best allies that we can be. I'm just going to... Oops, sorry guys, because I want to advance. There we go. So um, what can you do now to support equity for indigenous peoples? 
I talked a little bit about biodiversity and indigenous peoples along with the biodiversity of the planet are under threat. If you saw the latest life expectancy data throughout COVID, um, American Indian Alaska Native people lost 6.1 years in life expectancy. Their life expectancy today is the same as the US population was in 1940. Consider that. A little bit about the ally continuum. So, you know, many of us start, we're not aware, we're not aware of, of the history of our country and what's led to the inequities among Indigenous people. Become aware, become informed, and become active, and become an advocate. So, we're hoping that all of us will take up this mantle. The other thing is, a lot of people in our country say they don't even know a single Native American person. That is frightening. We have many indigenous scholars and faculty now in, in our school, in our university. I just encourage everyone to reach out. Also representation matters. We're so lucky that we now have the Secretary of the Interior, um, Deb Holland. She is going to do amazing things at that helm. So think about when you vote, how you can help um, Indigenous people represent um, this very important part of our, our population. At, at Johns Hopkins, um, we still are grossly underrepresented in Indigenous students, faculty, and staff. Our school is doing better than other divisions, but we need to fight. We need to fight for better representation. The second thing is, as those of you travel the halls as, as scholars and as students, ask and insist that there's inclusion of indigenous peoples, frameworks, and sciences in our curricula. There's, it's absent largely in much of our curriculum today. And, and finally, ensure that our environment and climate, the climate is inclusive in the, of indigenous peoples. If you've been in the school of nursing's courtyard, you see a beautiful land acknowledgement. We have a brand new building that's gonna be going up. We all need to advocate that there's land acknowledgement in that building that there's ways to acknowledge the first peoples who are on the lands that we now work on. So sorry, I'm having trouble with the slides. There we go. Um, and also, again, as Melissa has been a great teacher to me, but go beyond land acknowledgement. That is not enough. We can't be performative. We have to take greater action and more substantive action. So continue to ask ourselves as an institution, how can we do better? And then in terms of awareness, um, there's such great literature um, right now that's just exploding in the press. That's both fiction and nonfiction, but you know, consider these amazing authors and writers and filmmakers and just please immerse yourself to learn more. I'm sorry guys. Thing is really tricky. And then finally, um, among the countries that um, that include those who who have been the colonizers, um, so our country, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, we're the only one that hasn't had formal truth and reconciliation. We're the only country who has not made a formal apology to our indigenous people. So advocate for that in your work. Um, we have so much to do, and we have such great leadership here um, now at Johns Hopkins. So I think we can take advantage of that. So now I just want to take this amazing opportunity to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Donald Warren, who joined this Johns Hopkins School of Public Health on September 1st um, as the co-director of our center, and also as the new um, Provost Fellow for Indigenous Health Policy at the entire university. Dr. Warren is a member of the Ogala Lakota tribe from Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and is an acclaimed physician and public health researcher of chronic disease inequities, and comes from a long line of traditional healers and medicine men. He is also one of our nation's top educational leaders who created the first indigenous health focused masters of public health and PhD program in the United States. Dr. Warren will bring this experience to work at the university to build new indigenous health concentrations in the DRPH and MPH programs. He will also focus on promoting health policy to advance ind indigenous health equity, 
including developing a new health policy core at our center. We're so excited about that. And also expand our center's work to a broader network of indigenous communities in North America and across the world. So we're so excited to have Don with us to lead us off. Hello, thank you and welcome to all my relations here today. Very uh, pleased and honored to be a part of these discussions and the events here today honoring uh, Native American Recognition Month. And I really do appreciate the opening song and dance and, and blessing that we were uh, treated to, to today. So just wonderful event and really pleased to be here. As mentioned, my name is Dr. Donald Warren. I'm Oglala Lakota, originally from a small town called Kyle, South Dakota, on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And I always like to ask, how many people have been to Kyle, South Dakota? Wow, that's pretty good. That's like five or six. That's five or six more than usual. So that's really good to see. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, toward understanding of the treaty basis for American Indian healthcare. And our health system really is rooted in treaties that were signed between the federal government and the tribal nations. There are actually several hundred treaties that were signed and just a wonderful display. I hope you were able to take a look uh, on the first floor at the beautiful display of the, the importance of treaties. But to start this discussion, I think it's important to acknowledge that as Indigenous people, we have our own way of medicine and our own way of belief, and we have a long history of traditional medicine. And when we think about uh, traditional public health and the way we would promote health in our communities, it was in a very holistic way and in a very inclusive way. And when I uh, look at our history, of course, we don't have written language uh, history for, for most of our tribes, but we have an oral history and we have stories that have been passed on from generation to generation. And in the region where I'm from, there's a story of three sisters walking along a river. And as they're walking along the river, they see babies and young children in the water struggling to stay afloat. The first sister declares this is a crisis, it's an emergency, we need to get the babies out of the water right now. The second sister thinks about that and says, no, we need to teach the babies how to swim so they can survive while they are in the water. And the third sister keeps walking upstream and the other two get angry with her and say, where are you going? Why aren't you helping us? And she says, I'm going to find out who's putting these babies in the water and I'm going to stop them. And that's literally public health. That's literally working further upstream. And what I think we also have to acknowledge is that going upstream is different for each population. We can't have a one size fits all approach to how we address public health in uh, all populations. And certainly as indigenous people, we have a unique history and unique cultures and considerations when we're looking at public health, health policy and health equity. So we also have to acknowledge the fact that there's been a tremendous amount of loss and it's wonderful to see the land acknowledgement movement uh, growing and it's great to see that happening right here at Johns Hopkins as well. And of course, we did not draw the lines between US and Canada or US and Mexico. We, we never had those lines prior to colonization. But if we just look at the 48 states here that are, are highlighted, it was all indigenous land. It was all tribal land. And when we think about that deep rooted spiritual connectedness to place and the whole idea of land based healing and sacred sites, that's a tremendous amount of loss. And this is all uh, mediated by policies and decisions made by the federal government. Uh, things like removal of tribal nations from the Southeast, the whole impact of colonization with the 13 colonies, and then gold rush in California and all kinds of things happened over the years to really reduce our land base and our population base. But over these years, we've had many advocates working to try to improve outcomes and that includes in my own family. I'm very fortunate to have a photograph of my great, great grandfather. This is Chief Stabber. And uh, he was a Lakota chief in the 1800s. And this picture is actually from 1872. And he was one of the Lakota and Dakota chiefs who went to Washington, DC, so not too far from here, uh, to advocate on behalf of his people. And when I look at this picture, what I was taught from my elders, you can see that his right braid is wrapped up in the red cloth, but the left side is left open. And what that means is that they were not done negotiating. So they're right in the middle of negotiating for treaties, for land settlements. And when we think about healthcare for American Indians, 
the, through the treaties, the tribes exchanged land and natural resources for various social services, including housing, education, and healthcare. So that's why we have a BIA, a Bureau of Indian Affairs. That's why we have a BIE, Bureau of Indian Education. And that's why we have an Indian Health Service, the IHS. So when I hear people talk about Indian Health Service's free healthcare, I like to remind them that no, we exchanged vast amounts of land, including this land, and a lot of natural resources for those social services. So I look at the Indian Health Service as the largest prepaid health plan in history, because that's exactly what it is. And I was at a, a IHS budget formulation meeting many years ago, and one of the tribal leaders said it best. He said, if you wanna get rid of the Indian Health Service, that's fine, just give us our land back, right? So we are owed this through treaties. And I think it's important to acknowledge that history and why it's so important to have uh, the treaty basis really uh, be the starting point for uh, Native American Heritage Month here. And I know it's in uh, fine print, uh, but this is kind of a following a timeline of policy and treaties uh, throughout the years. So we've had tribal sovereignty long before there was a US constitution, right? So we had full sovereignty uh, with our, our people. And then there were policies of conquest that occurred during this time frame, even uh, here in the Northeast. And when we look at what happened, for example, in Massachusetts, you may have heard of Amherst, uh, uh, Massachusetts Amherst College, and, and it's named after Lord Jeffrey Amherst. And he's very well known in Indian country because he was one of the colonial leaders who ordered the distribution of blankets from a smallpox hospital to the regional tribes with the purpose of killing them. You can actually Google Amherst and smallpox and actually see the letters that he wrote ordering this. So that's a part of our colonial history. It's a part of US history. It's not a happy part of our history and it makes people in many cases feel uncomfortable to think about these things or to hear about these things. But I think it's important to acknowledge the truth of what's happened historically. And if we're ever going to get to equity, we have to walk through truth, even when it's uncomfortable for us. So it's important to acknowledge that history. And then going to the US Constitution, there's uh, what's called the Commerce Clause, which is Article 1, Section 8. And the Commerce Clause states that Congress shall, shall regulate commerce with the foreign nations and the Indian tribes. So going back to the US Constitution, there's an acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty. The tribes are put on equal footing as foreign nations. So in federal Indian law, that's the first acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty. Of course, we've considered ourselves sovereign long before there was a constitution, but it's in the constitution. Also in the constitution is the treaty clause as well as the supremacy clause. And the supremacy clause of the constitution is article six, clause two, and it's actually quoted uh, in the display downstairs as well. But it establishes that the constitution, federal laws made pursuant to it, and treaties made under its authority constitute the supreme law of the land. So treaties are the highest order of law in the land. And it's really our treaties that led to the development of things like Indian health programs. So when we look at this, there's a long history and we won't go into detail of the subsequent history of policy. But as we can see, we went through a period of assimilation, reorganization of tribal governance, termination of tribes. There was a period of time when the federal government would just decided to terminate tribal status. And that really had a negative impact on a lot of tribes. And then since the 1970s, the period of uh, self-determination and much more tribal control of health services. So on the left here, that's a graphic right from the Indian Health Service website. And it looks at the legal basis for federal services for American Indians and Alaskan Natives. And on the right, that is one example of a treaty. This is a treaty with the Potawatomi Nation in 1846. And I know it's in very fine print, but at the bottom it states, that the United States will give promise of all proper care and protection. So that was common language in many of our treaties, promise of all proper care and protection. Have American Indians received all proper care? Not even close. So if we look at the treaty basis and the treaties are the supreme law of the land, we can think of the treaties really as contracts between the federal government and the tribal nations. And I would put forth that the US government is in breach of contract right, that we have a treaty right to health care. And it's a stronger right to health care than even Medicare and Medicaid. Those are legislated, but they're not treaties. Uh, we have a right to health care if we work and we have employment, right? But that's not a treaty basis. 
the treaty basis for healthcare is the highest order of law in the land. Unfortunately, the federal government has not lived up to its responsibilities. So that's why it's so important, the work that we're moving forward with indigenous health policy and focusing on looking at this from a legal and policy perspective and recognizing that we're not asking for anything unusual. We're not asking for anything that's uh, uh, outside of what should be done anyway. We basically just need proper care and protection. That's what's in our treaties, and that's the, the type of services that we need. So we have all kinds of challenges in doing this work, of course. Uh, when you think about this, we have really pre-kindergarten through post-doc uh, disparities. We you know we have less people graduating from high school, less people graduating from college, less professionals uh, in healthcare, less educators. And we really have a shortage of role models in health sciences. And that's part of the work that we need to do as well. Uh, talking about the leadership development and education and bringing more indigenous people right here to Johns Hopkins and to take advantage of these wonderful educational opportunities and research opportunities as well. So when we look at the physician shortage, uh, just looking, we're really, <laughs> we have shortages across the board for health professions, but looking at MDs in particular, the, in the United States, according to the last census, we're nearly 3% of the US population, but we're 0.56% of physicians. And if you look at medical school faculty, it's less than half of 1% of medical school faculty are American Indian or Alaska Native. And again, I know the numbers are very small here, but this is looking at applicants to medical school. And unfortunately, the numbers are not improving the way we need them to. Over the last several years, we can see we average around 100 applicants to medical school. And in terms of those who matriculate, it's in the uh, high 30s or low 40s per year. Having 40 doctors a year trained is not going to solve the disparities that we're facing. So we have to look at what we're doing and how we can improve what we're doing. And a lot of that has a policy basis, but it also is rooted in leadership development and the fact that we need more role models. So here's some fascinating data right from the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges. And we know that the different ranks of a professor is assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor. In the United States, as, the, uh, as of the end of 2021, uh, the number of full professors at U.S. medical schools was 39,162, 39,000 professors of medicine. Of that number, 39 American Indians, literally one in a thousand. Now, I, I left the medical school at UND, so we're going to take one number off of that, unfortunately, and I'm here at the School of Public Health, but we have one less professor of medicine because I came here. So, so we're under 40, that's just ridiculous. This is 2022, is this acceptable to anyone? And I think it's important to have these types of events around Native American Heritage Month and increasing awareness. But what's really fascinating is that these data have been around for a long time, but people are just not aware of it. So I agree with what uh, uh, Allison said at the very beginning, it's not about one day or one month, it needs to be a constant level of education and bringing awareness to these challenges. And we, we need to, understand the data, and then more importantly, make a plan to address it um, equitably. So this is kind of a busy slide, but it's looking at uh, deans of medical schools. And I'll just cut to the, to the punchline here. Um, the number of American Indian medical school deans, you can count them on zero hands. That's how many we have. Zero American Indian deans at medical schools. Is that acceptable? Is that appropriate? So we have terrible shortages. So the workforce development efforts that we can lead here are going to be vitally important for that next generation. It shouldn't be unusual to have a professor of medicine who's American Indian or to have a dean who is American Indian or Alaska Native. Unfortunately, those are some of the challenges that we're facing. So in addition to the disparities in, in role models and faculty and physicians, we also, historically have had a lack of respect for indigenous healing systems and indigenous medicine. You know, historically, my tribe and many others would boil uh, willow tree bark and make a tea, willow bark tea. Does anybody know what medication comes from willow bark? Aspirin, yes, acetyl salicylic acid. So we would make willow bark tea. And if you look at the old medical anthropology texts, the, the traditional healers were criticized, you know, for having this a wild tea that they're using as a medicinal uh, uh, intervention. But then, of course, Bayer discovered it, and now it's you know, standard practice to, to use uh, aspirin. 
So, um, of course, in the, the chemists would call it an aqueous solution. We called it a tea, you know, and it's what we use medicinally. A lot of people also don't, re don't realize that the whole field of osteopathy, osteopathic medicine, is traditional American Indian medicine. So A.T. Still, who is the, the father of osteopathic medicine, grew up in Missouri, and he grew up with Shawnee and Oto Indians and learned their traditional ways of medicine. And then he called it osteopathic medicine. But the whole field of osteopathic medicine is actually traditional American Indian medicine. We have just dozens and dozens of examples of indigenous STEM and medical science that I don't think is adequately respected. And I think part of our research and our work moving forward also has to look at traditional medicine and traditional interventions. I think that we have enough empirical data to show that our current system is not working, right? We need to be more holistic, we need to be more culturally relevant, and we need to diversify medical leadership and public health leadership to recognize that there's more than one perspective. And we can thread that needle, we can blend the best of modern science and indigenous knowledge to have a better outcomes. So that's part of what we need to do as well. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, this image or similar ones looking at the differences between equality and equity. And I like this image a lot, you know, on equality, that's uh, everybody getting the same package of services or everyone getting the same curriculum. Uh, and we can see that for this example, the individual on the left didn't need it. It's serving the one in the middle pretty well, and the guy on the right is still underserved. When we take an equity approach, we're not just looking at the process, we're looking at outcomes. And we have to recognize that for some individuals and some populations, we need unique services. And in, in many ways, it feels like I'm saying one plus one equals two, but it's very difficult for systems to understand that they need to be flexible, that we cannot take a one size fits all approach to healthcare or to education. So we have to have an equity lens. And I'd been showing this image for a number of years. And then just um, uh, a couple of years ago, someone sent me a picture I think is just brilliant. And the question is, what is that fence doing there in the first place, right? Is it the package of services to overcome the barrier or do we need to get rid of the systemic barrier? And I would say systemic barriers include things like the federal government not living up to its treaty obligations to American Indians and Alaska Natives. A systemic barrier is the fact that we don't have enough American Indians and Alaska Natives as professors of medicine or professors of public health. As I understand it, I, I've asked a few people and they, they think that this is the case, but I'm a full professor here at Johns Hopkins University. And as we understand it, I'm the first American Indian in the history of Johns Hopkins to be a full professor at this university. That's not a pat on the back. What an indictment on our entire field, right? That we need to recognize these terrible disparities, but we also need to do something about it. That's the more important thing. So there's a lot that we can do right here. And I'm excited for uh, moving forward uh, in this work. Uh, this is me excited, by the way, just, just, just so you know. I just have to point that out because apparently I don't, I don't show it very well. But we, uh, we changed our name, of course, to the Center for American Indian Health. I really appreciate all of the work of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, um, Santosham and all the work that you and your team have done over the years to start the Center for American Indian Health. And we just recently named the, the, center, the center for Indigenous Health and recognizing that there's a lot of uh, challenges that Indigenous peoples face worldwide, not just in the US, but in other parts of the world too. As was mentioned, one of my other roles is as a provost fellow in Indigenous health policy. And I think there's a lot of wonderful work we can do in linking research and data to policy recommendations and try to improve outcomes for Indigenous health. We're also planning to develop, uh, in collaboration with our international partners, an Indigenous health database. We don't have a database with comparable data across Indigenous populations but we could look at some standard measures that are in many of our typical behavioral risk factor surveillance systems, but also include things like measures of historical trauma, measures of uh, personal or family history of boarding school participation or adverse childhood experiences, but also on the strengths-based side, look at measures of resilience. There's some uh, limited studies in Canada primarily, but they're showing that language preservation and cultural connectedness are protective of health. We need to scale that up. So we should measure that. We should look at language preservation. We should look at uh, cultural uh, connectedness and participation in ceremonies as part of the database that we're collecting. We're also looking to develop an international indigenous health postdoc program, a postdoctoral training program. And the idea is that it'd be a two-year training where students have six months each in either 
Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, Alaska, Canada, US, or Norway with the Sami population. Doesn't that sound wonderful to spend two years working with indigenous peoples worldwide? I, I want to do that postdoc, but of course, <laughs> I, I don't think I'll be able to. Also, as was mentioned, we're looking at an indigenous health DRPH. When I was at University of North Dakota, we did develop a PhD in indigenous health, but there still is not yet a doctorate in public health, a DRPH with an indigenous health specialization. So the way I look at this, the PhD in indigenous health is looking at public health through an indigenous lens. And the DRPH would be looking at indigenous health through a public health lens. Very similar, but there are some differences and we need the, the DRPH as well. Also, other projects include a traditional medicine uh, documentary and textbook. Unfortunately, we're losing a lot of our elders and knowledge keepers. So we need to preserve the knowledge and uh, make sure that the next generation understands the value of traditional medicine. And in closing, one last thought is that we learn a lot from the natural world. And where I'm from in the Dakotas, we observe the herds of bison. And it's always the strongest bison when there's a, an oncoming storm they stand and face the storm in a circle and they protect the ones who are more vulnerable behind them, the, the, the young, the elderly and the sickly. And it's those strong bison that actually stand directly and face the storm head on. And I would say that for those of us working in academics, we're so fortunate to be in these arenas and it's up to us to face those storms, to have the courage to acknowledge that we have a lot of disparities and a lot of challenges ahead of us, but it really is our responsibility to face those challenges directly and to make future generations healthier and more successful than ours. And I'll go ahead and end it there. Thank you all very much. Miigwech, Dr. Warren. Thank you so much for those words of truth. Um, sometimes the truth is difficult to hear, but it's also necessary for inspiration. So very inspiring and chimigwish, Dr. Warren. Um, now it gives me great joy to introduce Dr. Melissa Walls um, and she'll be presenting indigenous public health research and how representation matters. Um, Dr. Walls is Boys Fort and Kuchiching First Nation Anishinaabe. Um, she's co-director of the Center for Indigenous Health and she's Associate Professor of American Health here in the Department of International Health at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, Dr. Walls is most definitely committed to collaborative tribal community-based participatory research. Um, and it is inspiring to see her work. And um, I think no one could argue that her collaborative community-based participatory approach is second to none. Um, and I would just like to, ask you please to wel help me welcome um, my fellow Ojibwe sister, friend and mentor, uh, Dr. Melissa Walls. No, I'd like to sing. So I'm gonna do this. Okay, so we'll do Ooh, this but this isn't me. Here we go. Me, Gwich, Crystal, she almost brings me to tears. We get to work together in Duluth, Minnesota and um, what an honor to get to work with, with Crystal. You're just an inspiration to me. So, Buju, everybody. Memenguan Indishina Kazmagizi do a dam. Andrea, hi, how are you? I see people in the audience, and there are 170 participants on the Zoom with us today. That's amazing. So, Buju to all of you online. This is not fair. Dr. Warren is one of the most skilled presenters ever. It is not okay that I have to go after you, but here we go. Um, I am an open book. A lot of you have met this wonderful lady. This is my grandma, Gladys. And I am going to steal this time to ask you all at the count of three to say with me, happy birthday, Gladys, okay? So on the count of three, you're gonna do that, right? Happy birthday, Gladys. So one, two, three. She's gonna be so pumped. She, um, she, so this is a screenshot of a video she did during the height of COVID when she got her COVID um, vaccine. And she did a public service announcement on behalf of our center that went viral. And my cousin Pete, who lived in Germany called and said, Auntie Gladys, you're on TV in Germany. Somehow she showed up in Germany. 
she's a star she's 86 years old yesterday and she um uh she's a major inspiration to me and so i just i'll share that video with her she might be online if my mom could figure out the zoom but we doubt that that's possible as those of us who know cammy my mom know might not have happened but i bring grandma into um into the room today a because it's her birthday and all of you famous people just wished her a happy birthday but b because allison alluded to this and so did don um this is a very now well-known graphic from a recent report from the CDC that we're all talking about in public health. And we're all talking about this story that over the past few years, um, life expectancy has dropped for pretty much all Americans, right? What Don and I were just talking about before we opened um, this formal programming today is this has been happening to Indigenous Americans all along. Year after year, we see people like my grandmother dying younger than non-Native people's grandmothers. And year after year, we see life expectancy drop. And look at the end, AIAN stands for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, our life expectancy dropped far more than any other demographic group measured here on these slides during the COVID-19 pandemic. The causes of this, of course, are in part COVID, also unintentional injuries. Um, we have hugely disproportionate rates of loss due to the opioid epidemic and overdose and many other issues. And I bring this up because I want to call attention to another tool in our toolkit here at the Johns Hopkins School of Public, Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. And we have some representatives in the room from the initiative today. And um, many of you know about this, but I want to bring it up in part because um, it's part of the reason we're here today. I'll talk more about that in a second. And it's also a major reason why I'm able to live and work in Minnesota and yet be on the faculty here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health because of this initiative and an endowment. Those of you who know the initiative know it stands on these three pillars. One is equity. We just heard a lot about equity issues in indigenous health. The second is evidence. I would say whose evidence are we counting in this? You know, certainly research and empirical evidence matters, but we'll argue um, that we need to broaden our definitions of that. Um, and then policy change, right? So how do we get things um, to be systematically changed? Well, policy change is a big lever and Dr. Warren has a, a major role in that. And we're really excited about the work he's going to be doing uh, for policy change advocacy. The initiative focuses on five major areas. Many of you know this. Um, I've listed them here, and each of these areas are issues that disproportionately impact American Indian, First Nations uh, communities. I work primarily with American Indian and First Nations communities. We, for example, I work within the obesity and food systems track. We know that our communities have disparate rates of heart disease, type 2 diabetes. You heard a little bit about historical trauma through Dr. Warren's talk. Our communities have gone through massive nutrition transitions. That's a nice way to say forcible relocation and um, destruction of our traditional landways and practices, the food we eat, the way we gather it, our seasonal rounds. All of these things have been systematically attacked. And that's what leads to things like type 2 diabetes, right? Reliance on the government commodity food system. But at the bottom of each of these little buckets or categories, I've listed some of the areas of like innovation that tribes and indigenous peoples are engaging in to combat these issues. So yes, we have inequities. Yes, we need to address these years of life lost, but we know how to do it. <laughs> um, land back, also honor the treaties, all these things, right? So um, we have vibrant young activists who are doing this really cool work around protecting and reclaiming um, our culture and indigenizing harm reduction. Shout out to Andrea Medley in the crowd. We have our um, food sovereignty movements. We have coalitions to bring back our stolen sisters that are missing and murdered, murdered indigenous relatives. So in each of those focal areas, massive indigenous leadership is happening. But we need more, as you heard from Dr. Warren. And a key um, theme of what I'm here to talk about today is representation and why do we care? So. You've already heard a bit about this today. I think if you're in this room or in this Zoom, you probably care a little bit about it. So it's, you know, sort of telling the story that many of you already bought into. We care because exclusion has been the norm, right? Exclusion has been what is normal and still is normal at this point. We are not represented. This is true for many people of color, indigenous people, and other marginalized groups. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. Also, I think most of you know this, but 
diversity matters not just because it's a word that people like to throw around. It matters because that's where we're going to find the solutions to get us out of this mess. And by this mess, I mean the fact that Mother Earth has been trying to shed herself of us as a sickness through these pandemics, right? Like Mother Earth is telling us we're doing it wrong. We need to listen. And so diversity and diverse ways of knowing are critical to that fight. Indigenous ways of knowing, as Allison said, are critical to that fight. You all know, I hope, I, or maybe you don't, but maybe some of you on the Zoom um, are new to this, that the academy, and by the academy, I mean academia, was built around a very tiny microcosm of knowledge systems. Just a teeny sliver of the diverse ways of knowing that there are in the world. And then we perpetuate it and perpetuate it and perpetuate it. I'm a scientist, I perpetuate it, right? Um, and it's a shockingly small segment of human knowledge that we could be learning from. So diversity matters because we need to bring those knowledge systems back into, um, into the way that we react, to the way that we act um, to address these inequities. Representation also matters because, and Crystal alluded to this, to do this work, we must have relationship with communities of any kind of any color, of any racial or ethnic group, of any demographic group. I truly believe for health equity work to happen, you have to work with communities. And to do that, you must build trust. And to do that, you must put in the time. And I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, in my experience, the people who really put in the most time and bear the, the responsibility, shoulder that responsibility most, are people who are from those communities. We need more representation. We are exhausted, and it's only the second day of Native American Heritage Month. So um, I'm tired already. It's only day two. I need a vacation. OK, so enough. You get it. Representation matters. But there's more. Representation is unique for Indigenous peoples. If this is not a, about pinning us against other groups. This is not about whose inequity is the worst or whose disparity is you know, the one that we should worry about the most. It's about what Dr. Warren was talking about. It is about that pathway that came from all of this land being indigenous to almost none of this land being indigenous, although it still is, right? It is about historical trauma, that these inequities didn't come out of nowhere. They happened on purpose. And we have empirical evidence of how this works through all sorts of systems, whether that be forced relocation, separation of families, or other systems that have happened through all of the treaty of um, um, not being honored, all of the laws that you saw in Dr. Warren's timeline, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one particular area where we've been seeing recent attention is of course the boarding schools. Boarding schools happen uh, in many places, right? They happen in Canada, they happen here in the US. And May, 2022, we saw this report issued where, um, the Department of the Interior found so far 408 federal schools across 37 states or territories that were created to educate the Indians out, the Indian out of the Indians, right? That was literally why they were created. The point was eradication of who we are. And this was a slap in the face that I didn't know until I read the report. The investigation shows that the US used monies held in tribal trust accounts including those based on cessation of Indian territories to fund taking our children from us, literally taking the trust funds obligated to us to take our children. Now, I want everyone to look around. Who in this room is indigenous? Raise your hand if you are, please, if you feel safe to do so. Now, of you who are indigenous, how many have an ancestor who went through a residential school? Like all of us, yes. Holy crap. We are here. How did we survive? I am so like, it's a miracle that I am here, that you are here. And we just need all of you to recognize that. We shouldn't be here. Genocide attempts happen time after time after time. And if you haven't read the report, please read the report. Please read the report. But also to Don's point, why did it take until 2022 for the federal government to even create a list of the boarding schools? It's a list let alone find all of our babies who are still in unmarked graves. This is heavy stuff and this is real stuff and it impacts us still today. This is why representation matters. That report happened because this woman sits in the position to make it happen, right? 2022, it's not by accident. 
Yet, that's not the reality. We know, so Don showed you statistics for medical schools. I'm gonna show you for public health. Here we see um, graduates of accredited public health programs. The M is a master's degree. The D is the doctoral degree. You should be appalled by the inequities generally, but today we're focusing on Native Americans as listed here. In 96, zero doctoral degrees conferred, and then massive growth to a whopping two in 2016. Um, I think that's changing in part because of programs built by Don, in part because of places like the center and other schools, but we have so much work to do. Um, here are the professors in 1997, a grand total of two uh, professors of any kind. Hey, look, jumped to 12 in 2017. And that number has grown in part because of people like Victoria and Don and me and others here in this room. And um, that's great, but still not good enough. So this brings me back full circle to a tool in our toolkit. And that is um, a fellowship program. And I'm really excited because the Bloomberg American Health Initiative has partnered with our center to create a track for indigenous health scholars for this fellowship program. I'm gonna go through this rather quickly, but leave you with information. I think it's really important. It's part of what drew me to Hopkins beyond the, just the center, right, was this program. So the point of this fellowship, which um, it was created from an endowment, um, is to train fellows while they continue to do the work they're doing in their community. So stay where you are, learn and earn a fully funded master's or DRPH degree from Johns Hopkins University, which just happens to be the number one public health school in the world, right? Um, and, uh, and do that while connecting to other organizations that where uh, these fellows are located, right? Super cool network of practice, super cool opportunity. And then we have our annual summit, which the pandemic has made to be online until this year, we get to go to Philadelphia in December. So see you all there. Super cool program. And I'm really pleased. I don't know if all of the, I don't know if all the fellows are here. I don't, are you guys here? Raise your hand if you are. It might be online because they're mostly remote, but three, these are the first three fellows that are part of the indigenous um, health track, that concentration that we've developed in collaboration with the, um, the initiative. So actually you should clap for them, I think. Our big round of applause. If you're online, congrats guys. And you can see they're working in different areas, addiction, obesity and food systems and adolescent health. Everyone online in this room, tell your friends to contact Shane and Faria. This is the point in any presentation where you're like, how do I learn more? Get a hold of them. Shane is in the room here somewhere. And um, we really want you to apply. We will help you to apply. We need to build up this workforce and here's an opportunity to do so. Okay, just briefly, um, Allison mentioned this idea of allyship. So representation matters. And I had an elder tell me in Minnesota, Melissa, yes, representation is key. We're gonna fight for that. At the same time, we need allies to get this work done. It's many hundreds of years of oppression and we need help. Being an ally is something you can't call yourself right? You get to wait to see if an Indigenous person will call you that, so just know that. And um, there's a lot of work to do, right? So I think we are really challenging ourselves in the center to do this, and Crystal Green Sky, who is one of your MCs, is really helping us to rethink our governance structures. I really credit um, an ally in the center, Sylvie Perkins, for doing capstone work around this idea of critical allyship and giving us some principles to consider when we're rebuilding our governance. Um, so there are tools out there. Have to flash some beautiful faces. They're, some of them are a little smushed together, but this is pretty cool. This is the, um, these are the indigenous faculty members and senior staff members in our center. And if you look, Ray was alone from 1981 for a while onward. And then Victoria O'Keefe came in I think 2017. And now there's just been massive explosion of growth. So this is what happens, right? You know this, those of you who do inclusivity and diversity work. If you build it, we will come. And so we need to keep building this cohort, right? You can't just have one of us, we need more help. Um, and this is also true of our indigenous scholars, some of, some of whom are in the room today. All right, so I'm gonna bring it back down to somewhere depressing, and then I'm gonna end it on an uplifting note, okay? So, um, it's just a couple of minutes. 
because I know we're getting close to time. This is from um, the Federal Boarding School Report. Beginning with President Washington, the stated policy of the federal government was to replace the Indian culture with our own, meaning white culture. This was advisable as the cheapest and safest way of subduing the Indians and providing a safe habitat for the country's white inhabitants. Education was a weapon by which these goals were to be accomplished. Education was literally named a weapon by many of the quote unquote founders of what is now called the United States. Education through the residential schools, the boarding schools, education in all forms. We are sitting in an institution of education. So representation is not enough as we've been talking about. When spaces and places were not only not made for you but made to literally kill you, it's not easy. It can be a struggle. But man, don't underestimate indigenous people. So I love this word survivance. It comes from Anishinaabe scholar, Gerald Visner, and he calls survivance act of resistance. It is us renouncing a victim status. So historical trauma is true, it's painful, but we are not victims. It is the creation of hope and a future. We resist through evasion, not answering your call, oops. Um, irony, humor, storytelling. We adapt and we evolve. We are in a static thing. We're all different shapes, sizes, and colors, right? And how does this work in education? Well, this was news to me, but I found a thesis, a master, like it was an undergrad thesis, actually, that was really well written, um, from Australia. And a woman had been really looking at how Anishinaabe students were exercising survivance by, like, with their pen, in their essays, in their stories, renouncing the dominant narratives of the education systems they were in. But guess what? This was in the Carlisle Indian School that this was happening. These Anishinaabe boys and girls were fighting back with their pen. And there are many other indigenous scholars who have written about this. And I just find it so inspiring that in the depths of such despair, they fought back. And they did it with a cleverness that I wish I had. And they did it with a, in a way that inspires me. And it almost brings me to tears every time I think about it. So I'll end with this from the Black Physicians of Canada. We, we can learn from each other, right? I love this. Um, assimilation says, be like us and leave yourself behind. That's been the, the policy of our nation. Limited inclusion says, be a part of us and bring some uniqueness, but uh, not too much. Get that ribbon skirt off, Melissa, what are you wearing? Um, that's this thing that I'm wearing for those who don't know. Um, and belonging says, you belong here. This place is better because you are here and you are free to take up space. That's what we need to aim for. And I'll um, end today with the words of, from an article co-authored by Dr. Donald Warren. You may have heard of him. We're in a place that flags a movement towards an academic treaty, an academic treaty where our wonderful kaleidoscope of knowledge radiates through all aspects of academic publishing, curriculum, the way we mentor each other, the way we learn from each other, so on and so forth. So me which. Woo, yeah, you know, my heart is racing just listening to all of this. It is so moving truth telling moves our heart so deeply and thank you let's give them both another round of applause um as as dr walls mentioned um through these throughout our history we have been suppressed and um suppressed in so many ways language song ceremony was certainly some of those. And so it is my pleasure now to be able to share with you again and bite back up uh, Ralph and Enesotai and Angela to share our, our work, our ceremony, our art. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. I've learned so much from our speakers today that we have such a great way to go. 
in equity and representation. We'd like to invite our featured dancer back up at this time, Angela, who will be, who will be demonstrating the most contemporary of all native powwow dancing. This is called the Women's Fancy Shawl Dance. It originated in the Cannonball region of North Dakota in the 1960s, during a time when there were American, when Americans were changing the fabric and groups like the American Indian Movement, the Black Movement, the Chicano Movement, the Women's Movement were taking precedence and standing up to change in a positive way. Young Dakota people began doing a new style of dance that had never been seen before. They began to twirl. They began to lift their legs really high and express freedom of movement, something that had not been seen before on the native powwow scene. The older women discouraged this dance because change is hard sometimes, but yet change is inevitable. And so this dance has evolved into a modern art form among native people. And it is seen as a competition dance at many of our powwows that are held all throughout North America. Angela has a beautiful shawl, hence the name Fancy Shawl Dancing. On top, she, is, she has a center feather on top, which comes from the very center of the tail feather of a golden eagle. She has fully beaded matching beadwork, and I'm proud to say she did this herself. He said, you're lying. I did not do that video. <laughs> ah, you know, we Indians, we try and make somebody look good and they all just blow it for us. <laughs> anyway, on with the dance, the women's fancy shawl dance. <laughs> For those of you on Weight Watchers programs, the next dance we're going to do is a very special dance, a very specialized dance, I should say. 
My father and I are the co-founders of the World's Championship Hoop Dance Contest, which is held in Phoenix, Arizona, at the Herd Museum each summer. I mean, each February. And this dance began as a holistic ceremony with a small ring used by our healers, both men and women, who could look into this and look into the human body and extract diseases, other things that were evil. And it, it all was a holistic way of how our ancestors and some of our modern healers do things. And they also could look into the future with these small hoops. Well, it was in the 1940s that a man named Tony Whitecloud, who was from the Jemez Pueblo of New Mexico, developed a new style of dancing with multiple hoops. He would dance through these hoops and he would travel all across America, to the Chicago Exposition, to the American Indian Exposition in Oklahoma, the Gallup Indian Ceremonies, and many different Native people saw this dance, and it became popular until it became an artistic expression, and after this hoop dance was started in Phoenix, many of our dancers began traveling all over the world. Recently, uh, here in National Harbor in Washington, D.C., they had Cirque du Soleil uh, Totem, in which uh, some of the talent, uh, talented hoop dancers were able to dance. Well, Angela is going to be coming out and dancing through each of these hoops, many, making many beautiful objects that are found in nature. Watch for a man riding horseback, a butterfly coming out of his cocoon, a whirlwind, a thunderbird, and a reservation dog, I think. Anyway, enjoy this. This is The Hoop Dance by Angela Gladue. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Before we adjourn with our closing prayer, I would like to say that I have a daughter who's um, looking at medical school. I, I know she does want to become a nurse and possibly go beyond that. And I'd sure be proud if she went to this school. Oh, me, me, Gwich, so much. Um, Angela, that was stunning. There is not, I mean, speechless to be able to sit in the front row and see that for those of you who weren't in the front row, I hope you could see her feet. I mean, just the energy, but her feet were barely even brushing the ground. Stunning, beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you for the music, Dennis and Ralph. And we're really, really pleased and honored to have some closing words from Ralph. So I'll hand it off to you, Ralph. Would you all please rise? I'm very honored and privileged to uh, close with a prayer. This is uh, one of our way of life that's been handed down by our ancestors. Whenever there are two or three gathered together in his name, he will be amongst us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We call upon you at this time. We thank you that you have uh, given opportunities that we might learn that we all were put here in this creation by you for a reason. And we know that down through the years, there have been hardships, hard times for my people. But Father, we know that you are in control. You take care of everything. And all we have to do is give you the praise and the glory and honor in all things. I just pray now for each one that is here that uh, you will have them take with them uh, the knowledge that they have obtained here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Miigwech. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you to everyone for joining us today um, in this celebration of Native American Heritage Month. And we wish you all well, safe travels. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.